Well, the prosecution has now arrested. The defense even started its case today in the Murdoch murders trial. Our expert trial analysis coming every day from trial attorney Carl B. Grant. So, Carl, let's just start with kind of a big picture overview. Mm -hmm. The prosecution, did they make their case? Well, I believe that the prosecution has put on a lot of strong evidence. Uh, they offered a theory and they uh, have, I think, pretty much connected the dots. Uh, what they have done with their witnesses is establish a timeline that is very tight. And it leaves the viewer and the potential juror to say, well, if he didn't do it, who did? Where was there an opportunity for somebody else to commit this crime? So I think they've got the defense in a tight spot here. And uh, that's what the defense is going to have to figure out, how to get out of that tight spot. Yeah, and what would you say was the strongest piece of evidence that you heard today? Well, I think the strongest piece of evidence in this entire case has been those videos, those Snapchat videos. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think that's something that the, the defense has had a difficult time responding to, uh, especially when so many people who know your voice said with absolute certainty, 100% certainty, yes, that was your voice, mm -hmm. and you were there at the dog kennel at the, at the important time. So that's, I think, the most strong evidence in, that, in the case for the, uh, for the prosecution. Now, in the defense, they go back to the basics. Mm -hmm. If he did it, then why is there no blood? You know, that's their resounding theme. Why is there right. no, no DNA? All of the kind of evidence that you would expect to see. So that's, that's the evidence that we have to deal with, and that's the decision the jury's going to have to make. Well, and one thing we have learned from this trial, especially testimony today, my goodness, technology is it can be damning and indicting, can it not? Absolutely. I mean, the way they laid out that timeline today of everything that happened with these phones from when the phone was locked, when the back uh, lit screen was on, where it was last seen, his speed in his car. I mean, that all helped drill down on that timeline that you talked about giving him very little wiggle room. Absolutely. Who would have thought a smartphone or a smart car for that matter mm -hmm. can provide so much detailed information about your whereabouts? Uh, I'm old enough to remember the days of the bag phone. Oh, yeah. I don't know whether they could do that back then, <laughs> right. but these smartphones can be dangerous if you intend to be a criminal. Yeah, and it really raised questions, especially when it came to Maggie Murdoch's phone, the fact that Alec Murdoch's uh, records were showing that he was driving past the location where her phone was found, uh, possibly tossed out. And I also thought it was interesting that the prosecution pulled up a message from May of 21, where Paul told Alec Murdoch, the son, that he found uh, pills. Mom found, found pills in your computer bag and, and they want to talk to him. So the family knew, obviously, that he had some type of drug addiction. So does the prosecution use that? Maybe as motive as well. The prosecution is going to argue that as well. Now, now, of course, they must stick to the horse that they've already decided to ride. Mm -hmm. That is the financial crimes. Jurors do not like it when you've said one thing is your motive or your theme of the case and you switch to another. However, you can argue all evidence that tend to show guilt or all evidence that tend to show that the defendant is not guilty. So that's the, that's the, that's the point of being a power advocate. You argue what you have and, and you, uh, what, it, what the evidence presents and try your best to persuade the jury as powerfully as you can. And Carl, after the, the uh, prosecution rested today, you know, the defense asked for that directed verdict. How often does that happen? And then kind of a part two, when we look at the possibility of the prosecution presenting a rebuttal case, are they able to bring new items of evidence in or can they only legitimately stick to what has already been entered into evidence and or testified about? Let me answer that two part okay. question. Jury, uh, Judy, I'm sorry, Jury, calling you Jury. <laughs> <laughs> I want no part of this Jury, <laughs> right. <laughs> Judy, in 37 years, uh, JAG lawyer, uh, trying cases in federal court, state court, outside of South Carolina, not one time have I ever seen a motion for directive verdict Granted. Okay. All right. That's how difficult they are uh, to win. Now, naturally, the law applies. If the evidence is there, then, of course, the judge would have to grant. But here's the point. If your evidence is so miserably weak, where a, a motion for a directed verdict can't be granted, why bring the case in the first place? Yeah. Why bring it? Okay, so that's the, uh, that's the point on that. Now, give me mm -hmm. your second point again. Well, in terms of the rebuttal argument yes. that the prosecution will have an opportunity to make, sure. can they bring in new evidence at that point, or do they only have to address what's already been entered into evidence and testified rebuttal about? Rebuttal means exactly that. Okay. You can only rebut what has been presented. So, no, you cannot bring up new evidence. Mm -hmm. And where do you think the defense is going to go at this point as far as the approach they will take in now calling their witnesses, and is there a chance that we may see Eddie Smith 
also known as Cousin Eddie on the stand, the man that is accused of helping uh, Alec Murdoch uh, do this attempted suicide. And the accused of being his drug dealer, right? And the accused yeah. of being his drug dealer. Well, I think the defense has already revealed that they intend to call experts. Mm -hmm. So then it becomes the battle of the experts. The prosecution has had experts, now the defense calls experts. So now the jury has to weigh, number one, the testimony, mm -hmm. uh, the demeanor, and the credentials of those experts. Which expert are you going to believe? who has the better credentials, who came across as the more persuasive witnesses. So that's what they're going to have to decide with regards to the experts. Regarding Cousin Eddie, mm -hmm. they could call Cousin Eddie because he's on the witness list, but here's the point. Cousin Eddie could also decide to take the Fifth Amendment because he obviously has charges that are pending. Right. Now, it could turn a dramatic moment. Here's how it can go. The, the defense could say, here's the strategy. We know he's going to take the Fifth, mm -hmm. but we're going to call him before this jury and try to have him take the Fifth before the jury's very eyes so we can argue, aha, why did he take the fifth? Mm -hmm. Then we argue as to why we thought he took the fifth. Now, the prosecutor can be smart about that and say, wait a minute, we're not going to let you play that game before this jury and take the matter with the judge mm -hmm. and handle, handle it out of the presence of the jury on that issue before Eddie's even called. So now you're making me think about a, another question regarding Alec Murdoch. If he testifies, mm -hmm. which that's, of course, the big question everyone's waiting to see, could he, Carl, take the stand and pick and choose which questions to answer, essentially pleading the fifth to questions he doesn't want to answer. He cannot. He okay. cannot okay. say, I'm going to uh, talk to you about the murder and give all this <clears throat> exculpatory information as to how I did not commit the murder. However, when you ask me about the financial crimes, I'm going to assert the fifth. He cannot. If he decides to get on that stand, Judy, and take a bite of that apple, he's got to eat the whole thing. And the prosecution will be allowed to cross-examine him and ask him about everything. What happens if he refuses to answer the question. Well, he, he won't even be able to get on the stand. Okay. You know, unless he's willing to waive his Fifth Amendment right. Wow. That is, yeah, wow. That's interesting. All right, well, the jury will get a break, um, and our crews will get a break on Monday for President's Day, but we'll be back at it on Tuesday. Any guesstimation, I know it's just a ballpark because there's such a long witness list, but any guess on how long you expect the defense to take in presenting its case? The two witnesses that they had today were kind of immaterial to the case as far right. as mm -hmm. outcome determinative, if you will. Uh, but when they get into the experts, we know that could be a lengthy cross-examination, a lengthy direct examination. So I would expect that the defense case would probably last all of next week. Okay. 